Hello everyone. We are going to go to chapter 14 in the text from slavery to freedom, a history of African Americans. Uh, by in our, in our text we have been using by Franklin and Higginbotham. We are going to to skip over to as I said chapter 14. We have finished the last time we met via video the last recording was from chapter 11 and if you recall chapter 11 was entitled the promises and pitfalls of reconstruction and those dates were 1863 to 1877 and reconstruction is that time period that comes after the civil war they wanted to reconstruct the south because the civil war had devastated the south socially, politically, and economically. And so there was an effort to, although a failed effort, to reconstruct the South and to even appoint uh, African American officials in, in government, in US government as well. But because of racism and the, the resentment of the Southern leaders, they ultimately came back to power and a lot of the concessions that were made and the progress that was made during Reconstruction is undone. But we're going to skip forward in the interest of time. We're in, nearing the end of the semester and so we want to go to chapter 14 and <laughs> we're going to skip from the Civil War to World War I because there are some things I want to deal with before the end of the semester. Chapter 14 is entitled, In Pursuit of Democracy. Answering the call to fight is some subtopics, Jim Crow military camps, service overseas on the home front. And so we are going to actually pull up our PowerPoint from chapter 14. This is what I meant to do all along. And you can see um, our, our title there. So let us start with really to go to page 327 and we'll start there and, and actually what I'm going to try to do is also pull up the textbook as I also speak on this and you can follow along and see where I am. I might be able to enlarge it. So. Um, let me share my screen again because you might be able to see. Yep. Okay, so chapter uh, 14, you notice that the picture, uh, in the picture there at the bottom of your screen, in this modern technology here, let's see if I can make it bigger. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's it's a little better. You can see the images there. And in the caption, members of the 369 Regiment coming home 1919. And the, the dates, that's during the time of the uh, Civil War. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> World War One. We have been talking about Civil War for so long. Uh, during the time of the first world war and you see the 369th that is a colored troop they had segregated troops in those days and um you see that there the the, the date of the world war one was 1914 to 1918. members of the harlem base 369th Regiment celebrating as they arrived in New York after fighting in Europe in World War One. So you see that they are indeed African Americans. A big part of African American history is our involvement in U.S. military conflicts. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by images because they were these men 
are no longer on earth, but they were youth, youthful back then. They were young men. So war is not for old men unless they're the leaders and generals. So let us go to our slide presentation a little bit more deeper into some of the topics at hand. Excuse me as I go back and forth. So answering the call to fight. The U.S. entered World War I in April 1917. So the war had gone on for um, three years and before um, the U.S. entered. Uh, Selective Service Act was passed in May 1917. There was no racial restrictions. Um, there was much racism in the armed forces. Black men were rejected for officers' commissions. Um, in the years leading up to America's entrance, this is uh, on page 329, uh, under answering the call to fight. In the years leading up to America's entrance into the war, the military showed little sign of preparedness. By the beginning of 1917, it had become obvious to the nation's leaders that a far larger force was needed than the regular army's relatively small number of enlisted men. I'm going to do what I said, did earlier. I, I think I might be able to, let's see how clear it is visibly. Um, I might be able to um, share it on the screen, this passage here. As I read, and we can read together. Yeah, that's better. We are um, in the middle of this paragraph. By the beginning of 1917, it had become obvious to the nation's leaders that a far larger force was needed than a regular army's relatively small number of enlisted men in National Guard, of which black soldiers made up a small portion. Blacks in the military were serving in the 9th and 10th Cavalries, in the 24th and the 25th Infantries, and in the various National Guard units, the 8th Illinois and the 15th New York, separate battalions of the District of Columbia and the Ohio National Guard, separate companies of Maryland, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Tennessee National Guard. So you had African Americans throughout the military, even at that time in 1917, fighting in various conflicts or various uh, regiments. Despite the pr protests of Mississippi's James Vardaman in the Senate, Congress rejected the idea of a whites-only draft and passed the Selective Service Act in May 1917 with no racial restrictions. We talked about that earlier. Thus opening up the nation's armed forces to a far greater number of black men. So keep in mind you had um, African Americans serving in the uh, various units throughout the U.S. You had the in the District of Columbia, the Ohio National Guard, in Maryland, Connecticut, Massachusetts, the Tennessee National Guard, Etc. and so forth. The 25th Infantry, the 9th and 10th Cavalries, but it opened it up even more broadly when they passed the draft, the Selective Service Act, that had no racial restrictions. On July 5th, 1917, the first day of registration, more than 700,000 black men signed up for Selective Service. Back then, everybody wanted to go fight. There was this propaganda that made it seem very noble to go to war, and it hid a lot of the atrocities that took place in in war. Nowadays, and a lot of people are not signing up because they, they we understand the realities of war back then. Some of those things were hidden. Uh, before the end of wartime draft, 2,290,525 blacks have registered. So over uh, about nearly 2.3 million uh, by the end of the wartime draft has signed up. Blacks uh, have registered, 367,000 of whom were called into service. In some southern counties, draft boards sought to fill their quotas with blacks before even turning to whites. In other counties, the reverse occurred, with whites being inducted first to forestall the possibility of arming black men as soldiers. People were afraid of that. In the end, out, however, African Americans were disproportionately represented in the draft. Approximately 31% of all blacks who registered were accepted, compared to 26% of registered whites. In absolute terms, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, um, um, uh, towards the 
from there in the third paragraph. Um, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina drafted a larger number of African Americans than of whites. Unlike the uproar over enlisting black troops during the Civil War, the necessity of raising enormous manpower to fight the war, war, war made the use of African American troops immediately self-evident to the great majority. So in, in other words, they realized, this happened during the Civil War as well, they realized that they couldn't get the job done without enlisting blacks, so all of a sudden they could overcome their prejudices and allow them to fight. And that's the same thing that happened with George Washington um, during the Revolutionary War, I meant to say. Um, he, he realized that they needed more troops, and so uh, he, he went ahead and let, let the African Americans fight. So we see, in that way, history uh, kind of repeating itself. So um, just moving on, uh, there was much racism um, in the iron, iron, iron forces, armed forces, as you uh, might have guessed, um, Jim Crow segregated troops, uh, etc., and so forth. Um, fewer blacks received marriage exemption, which was based on. Let me pull up my slide presentation here. You can see what I'm looking at here. So, although they allow African Americans to fight, there was still considerable racism in the military. Okay, here we go. Um, this is I'm reading page three. This is three thirty. Fewer blacks received the marriage exemption, which was based on a wife's dependent status. The selected service boards in the South routinely defined as dependents, white wives, specifically those who did not work outside the home, but this was not done for black women. Outside work was expected, even forcibly demanded upon them, that is, African Americans. For example, in some southern towns, Black married men, women were fined if they did not work. And in Vicksburg, I'm oh, sorry, this is a, a discrimination against uh, white wives. It's talking about at this particular time how they treated the uh, discrimination against African American wives, how they treated the white wives better while the husbands was out fighting. For example, in the southern towns, black married women were fined if they did not work. And in Vicksburg, Vicksburg, Mississippi, local whites even went so far as to tar and feather two black women who refused to work outside their home while receiving allotments from their husband's military service. In Monroe County, Alabama, County, Alabama, draft boards called up married white men if childless and black men with one child. One board in Georgia was discharged because of its flagrantly racist policies denying exemptions to blacks. Um, although the draft opened to blacks and whites alike, racism in armed forces was undeniable. In Jim Crow atmosphere, in the Jim Crow atmosphere of early 20th century, we're in the second paragraph on page 330. In the Jim Crow atmosphere of early 20th century, America white soldiers and members of Congress sternly rejected offering black men officers commissions. When the United States entered World War I, there were only a handful of African American military officers, all of them long serving regulars. The highest ranking black officer in 1917 was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Young. He was born March 12, 1864, so he was born into slavery. He died January 8, 1922. Young, the third black graduate of West Point, was commissioned in 1890, 1889. He served in service in the Spanish-American War, in the pre-American incursion into Mexico, and in the Philippines. At the time of America's declaration of war in 1917, some senators complained that as a lieutenant, Colonel Young would outrank the white captains. 
So they were concerned about that. Now, is that racism again? Um, lieutenants commanded, commanding segregated black units. Army officials then endeavored to force his retirement. They didn't want to be under a black man. They found young, uh, oh, I skipped. Um, they forced his retirement. They found young unfit for active duty based on medical condition, on uh, medical condition, on a medical condition. High blood pressure and kidney disorder discovered in a routine physical examination. Young attempted to prove his physical fitness by riding horseback from Ohio to the nation's capital. <laughs> so he, he went to extraordinary lengths just to prove he was physically fit. His effort did not persuade the army until five days before the end of the war, at which time he was reinstated. Wow. Promoted to colonel and called to duty with the Ohio National Guard. So let us move on. There was uh, Jim, Jim Crow um, military camps. Um, in World War One, this is page 332. In World War One, blacks served in many army units, cavalry, infantry, engineer corps, signal corps, medical corps, hospital and ambulance corps, and uh, on and on and on. Uh, veterinarian corps, sanitary and ammunition trains, Stevedore regiments, labor battalions, and depot brigades. They also worked as regimental adjutants, judge advocates, that is, army lawyers, chaplains, intelligence officers, chemists, clerks, surveys, uh, clerks, uh, surveyors, drafters, auto repairers, motor truck operators, and mechanics. So, uh, African Americans served in all these capacities. Um, that that's they were very skilled and, and talented, and they weren't just laborers. You know, uh, judge advocates, or chemists, chaplains, um, intelligence officers. Uh, after a long struggle, they became eligible to join coast and field artillery units. Artillery units. They remained barred from the Marines and were permitted to serve in the Navy only in menial capacities. So that's Jim Crow meaning uh, segregation. White communities did not want a large number of black soldiers in their midst. Training African Americans in Army Domestic camps continually plagued the War Department since most white communities did not want large numbers of black men in their midst. Um, although the Army was committed to activating an all-black division, for example, it did not permit the members of the all-black 92nd Division to train together in a single location, a separate cantonment but rather scattered the soldiers in different locations, sending them to seven widely separated camps, chiefly at Camp Grant in Rockford, Illinois, and Camp Upton in Yap Hank, New York, as well as at five other camps. There was rampant discrimination. This is on page 33 at the top. There was rampant discrimination. It permeated the United States Army and civilian agencies that it served. The Progressive Interracial Ecumenical Organization, the Federal Council of Churches, founded in 1908, created a committee on welfare of Negro troops specifically to investigate racial conditions at home and abroad. So it was a religious organization, the Federal Council of Churches, was a progressive religious organization, and they were expressly investigating uh, racism within the military. The council's two field secretaries, Charles H. Williams of Hampton, Hampton Institute and G. Lake Imes of Tuskegee Institute, found many examples of discrimination and segregation in the service agencies. 
at Camp Green near Charlotte, North Carolina. They investigated discrimination by the YMCA. So even the YMCA discriminated. None of the five YMCA buildings in the area would serve the 10,000 African-American recruits that were stationed there. This was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, a sign over one of these buildings even announced that this building is for white men only. So that's the Jim Crow we were talking about. A single table was provided for the use of black soldiers who wanted to write letters to family and friends. At Camp Lee, near Petersburg, Virginia, white soldiers patrolled around a white prayer meeting to ensure that no blacks attempted to enter. That's just wicked and evil. That's just, a, that is not a spirit of God. This was the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Organization. And that, in this particular case, um, it was a prayer meeting going on. And prayer, prayer meeting for whites only, that doesn't even sound right. Um, so black troops face discrimination from the Army and civil agencies that it serves, such as the YMCA. Jim Crow military camps. Um, African Americans begin to fight back. Um, there was a response to riot in Houston in August 1917 enraged African Americans and shook their faith in their government. Um, white citizens in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where the black 15th New York Infantry was training, felt uncomfortable with the buoyant self confidence expressed by Northern soldiers in their midst. In October 1917, when Noble Sissel, the talented drum major of the infantry band, entered a hotel to purchase a newspaper, the proprietor cursed, this is page 334, second paragraph, cursed at him, demanding that Sissel remove his hat when approaching a white man. Before Sissel could respond, the white man knocked his hat off his head. Understand, he's a soldier, he's a military man. He should be respected. As the young soldier stooped to pick it up, the man struck him several times and kicked him out of the place. On discovering what had happened, the black militiamen started to rush the hotel, quote unquote. But Lieutenant James Reese Europe the well-known black bandmaster happened to be passing by. Europe called the men to attention and ordered them to disperse. The following evening, the soldiers planned to shoot up the entire town of Spartanburg. But their commanding officer, a white man named Colonel William Hayward, overtook them as they were leaving and ordered them back to the camp. War Department's Emmett Scott, having rushed to Spartanburg to investigate the situation, pleaded with the men to do nothing to bring dishonor on either their regiment or their race. The War Department considered three possible scenarios in order to prevent the reoccurrence of such issues. Incidents. It could keep the regiment at Camp Wadsworth a face, and face a violent eruption it could re re remove the regiment to another camp, conveying the impression that the military would yield to community pressure. Or, thirdly, it could all order the regiment overseas. The war, the war Department decided on the last alternative. The 15th New York Regiment, now designated as the 369th Infantry of the United States Army, went to Europe, becoming the first contingent of African American combat troops to reach the Western Front. This is World War I. As they left the country, the soldiers of the 15th New York might well have reasoned that defending democracy in war torn Europe will be easier than in their own country. Wow. Uh, more on the 369th. The African, -American, the African American troops among the first combat forces to go overseas. We talked about that. From July 1918 on, the 369th, the 369th 
saw almost continuous action against the enemy. The 369th first and longest serving regiment assigned to support a foreign army. So they were very valiant, valiant and uh, a lot of times we don't hear about individuals like this in our history books. This is uh, black, uh, black American Buffalo soldiers. This is of the 367th Infantry, 77th Division in France. Decoration of the African American soldiers. I like these old images. Service overseas, uh, German propaganda, um, the leafleted black troops on the 90, 92nd Division urging them to desert U.S. Army, promising liberty, democracy, and equality. And this is his, history repeating itself because if you remember during the Revolutionary War, the, um, the British were trying to get enslaved people to desert the um, the patriot cause, the, the American cause, and to become, begin fighting for uh, the British. And many did do that, if you remember us talking about that. Um, but in this case, they were uh, dropping leaflets, uh, et cetera, and so forth, um, trying to get the African Americans to come aboard. When the Germans realized that they were facing an African American division, they launched a propaganda campaign to accomplish with words what they had not been able to achieve with arms. On September 12th, they scattered circulars across the line, trying to persuade the 92nd to lay down his arms. The printed material written in English argued that African American soldiers should not be deluded into thinking that they were fighting for democracy, as President Wilson claimed. The circular read, quote, what is democracy? Personal freedom, all, what, what is democracy? Personal freedom, all citizens enjoying the same rights socially before the law. Do you enjoy the same rights as the white people do in America? This is actual propaganda that the Germans send out. The land of the free, and democracy, are you rather not treated over there as second-class citizens? Can you go into a restaurant where white people dine? Can you get a seat in the theater where white people sit? Is lynching the most horrible crimes connected therewith a lawful proceeding in a democratic country? The circular also, unquote, the circular also asserted that Germans like blacks and that the circular also asserted that Germans liked blacks and treated them as gentlemen in Germany. Why, quote, why then fight the Germans only for the benefit of the Wall Street robbers and to protect the millions they have loaned to the British, French, and Italians? The propaganda message closed by inviting the African American troops to surrender and come over to German lines where they would find friends to aid them in the cause of liberty and democracy. <laughs> um, and the, this is page 339, the end of the third paragraph. Not one black soldier took the bait and deserted. Seems like I would have, but you know, I'm not, I wasn't in that situation. Um, slander campaigns, black troops criticized if, suffer, if they suffered defeat. Uh, they became the brunt of slander campaigns. At the time, African American, this is the bottom of 339, last paragraph. At the time, the African Americans came under severe criticism by white American commanders and soldiers who posited any and all failure to achieve a successful mission as a reason for inferiority, inferiority of black troops in combat. It mattered little that white units suffered defeats for the same reason as did black, um, black units, the black troops alone were faulted for 
efficient training and the failures even of whites, they blamed it on blacks and became the scapegoats. This is the well-known lieutenant that we talked about, Lieutenant James reached Europe, the one that uh, experienced the discrimination and uh, rather than uh, have him reside over white officers, they uh, accused, uh, they, they uh, doctored up his, uh, they said he was physically inferior, we talked about that earlier, and uh, showed it on the so-called medical records. Uh, women's war work, and so women had to, when their husband was, husbands were away fighting, um, they had to support the war effort um, in different ways, and, and also women were involved um, in the military. Um, nurses, you see nurses here, um, there's another image um, showing women, uh, women assisting men, nurses helping. Uh, let's see if I can find that image here. Yeah, I'll pull that up for you. You can see another image of a, a women in war. Well, that's the shoot and saw the nurses. If I don't find it, I'll maybe show you later, but well, we'll just move on. <laughs> Needless to say, nevertheless, um, there were uh, women assisting, and we do have this image here that I pulled up earlier. Um, African-American soldiers found uh, greater opportunities to move about freely in Europe and in France um, because they had less discriminatory laws than the United States of America. Let me just move on. I was looking for something else. I'll just keep going here. Um, getting back to what we were talking about, um, in our slide presentation, let me go back to slide presentation here. Okay. Pull this back up for you. All right, here we go. Um, service overseas, the YMCA and the YAA, YWCA. YWCA, I guess I'm tired, uh, in France provided services for the Black Soldiers Conference. They had better opportunities. I got ahead of myself. I said this earlier. They had better opportunities um, in France. Let me, let me just read a little bit of this on page 340 at the bottom. In contrast um, to the YMCA's in the American South, the YMCA and the YWCA in France Serve black soldiers overseas by providing literacy classes, libraries, canteens, letter writing facilities, and other services by provi uh, by for men's comfort. African Americans engaged in this work included Matthew Bullock, Daisy Croom, John Hope, William J. Faulkner. Etc. and so forth. These were African Americans that were involved in that effort. Of the 60 African American chaplains in the United St States Army, approximately 20, 20 ministered to the spiritual needs of black soldiers overseas. YMCA workers Addie Hunton and Catherine Johnson wrote about their experiences among black troops in France. Although African American nurses in the United States offer their services in large numbers, not alluded to this. The government was very slow to accept them and sent them overseas only after the fighting had ended. During periods of rest and recuperation, and also after hostilities had ceased, some blacks attended French universities in Paris, Bordeaux, Toulouse, 
uh, Marcel. So, um, coming home. Let's look at a little bit of, at that section on page 342. Some whites worried that freedom in France affected U.S. race relations. Um, toward the end of the war, reports came to the United States that the African-American soldiers stationed in France had developed habits and practices that would prove detrimental to interracial stability on their return to the United States. With the war over, by December 1918, concern rose to such an extent that the War Department asked Robert R. Morton, Booker T. Washington's successor, at Tuskegee to go to France, investigate the rumors, and examine the conditions affecting African American soldiers. The Secretary of War and the President placed every facility at Moulton's disposal and arranged for him to travel freely among black troops. Moulton made many speeches to groups of black soldiers, including these remarks, which he included in his autobiography. Quote, you have been tremendously tested your record has sent a thrill of joy and satisfaction to the hearts of millions of black and white Americans, rich and poor, high and low. You will go back to America heroes as you really are. You will go back as you have carried yourself over here in a straightforward, manly, and modest way. If I were you, I will find a job as soon as possible and get to work. I hope no one will do anything in peace to spoil the magnificent record you have made in war. Although some African American soldiers who served in France were hesitant about making the return trip to the United States, lest they lose what democracy and freedom they had found in faraway places, the great majority seemed anxious to return. Some doubtless believed that conditions would be better than before, while others were indifferent to the future, thinking only of the pleasures of being home again. So let, let us move forward. Uh, troops enthusiastically return home. African American supports the war. Blacks joined uh, the domestic war effort. War bonds, production, conservation of food. So they were involved with those efforts uh, with their white counterparts as well. At the same time, the black, the black press came into his own, its own. The black press was really an important voice at that particular time. And yet it was in this very environment, this is uh, page 346, I wanted to share the third paragraph that the black press came into its own. Black newspapers encouraged African Americans to move to industrial centers to search for work, urged support of the war, protested racist incidents, this is the black press, the black newspaper, and also led in the fight for complete integration of blacks in the military and American life. Older newspapers such as the Baltimore Afro-American and the Chicago Defender enjoyed unprecedented growth, while newer ones such as the Pittsburgh Courier and the Norfolk Journal and Guide made rapid strides both in circulation and in influence. The African American press, while generally supportive of the war effort, did not fail to expose racial injustice. At a conference sponsored by Emmett Scott in June 1918, 31 leading black newspaper publishers denounced mob violence, called for the use of black Red Cross nurses, requested the return of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Young to active duty, and asked for the appointment of a black war correspondent. Ralph Tyler of Columbus, Ohio, was subsequently designated as the war correspondent by the government's propaganda arm the Committee on Public Information, he sent press dispatches from Europe to black newspapers back home. Interesting. He's a black war correspondent. He sent, sent um, updates back to the black papers. 
His story generally gave glowing accounts of the gallantry and heroism of black troops overseas. And the black exodus. This is on page 347. Thousands of African Americans moved from the South into Northern cities, the Great Migration. That's why you have like a higher population of African Americans in Cincinnati, um, moved to the city center in places like New York, Chicago, Detroit. Um, this is a hi historical um, incident that happened in the, the early 20th century. They were looking for work and other opportunities. So you had an um, exit after the war. Uh, new job for women. I, I really like this uh, particular uh, advertisement, this poster. Uh, this poster expresses the optimism about the new employment opportunities for African-American women. That open open uh, the war opened up, the war opened up these opportunities. Everyone is getting used to overall women in machine shops. This one says women have made good as streetcar conductors and elevator operators. Clerical work quite a new job for Negro girls. Slav Italian and Negro women making bed springs. The war brought us women traffic cops and mail carriers. Laundry and domestic work didn't pay, so they entered into the garment trade. And the legacy of lynchings, riots and lynchings, outbreak of racial injustice, damaged morale that was briefly buoyed by stories of black wartime violence. 58 African Americans lost their life to lynching in 1918. Racial Clashes in both North and South continue. And that's all for today. We'll come back with, so you can go ahead and read chapter 15. And we'll go into chapter 15. Chapter 15 gets into one of my favorite um, areas because it deals with, uh, I think it's the chapter that deals with the arts and getting into the Harlem Renaissance and uh, the art that was, oh, that's, that's 16. So fit, the next chapter is Voices of Protest, the earlier seeds of the Civil Rights Movement, but 16 deals with the arts. Uh, I will see you next time, and uh, we'll talk further. Have a wonderful day.